Professor of Philosophy and Austerly Professor of Thomistic Studies here at Notre Dame. And I'm here to introduce Ralph Wood, um, a man distinguished as a uh, literary expert. So there, talk about a dialogue of cultures right there. Uh, a philosopher introducing a literary expert. I thought we kicked you guys out of the Republic a long time ago. <laughs> um, Ralph, uh, Professor Wood, uh, <laughs> is a university professor of, let me get this straight, re religion and literature? Theology. theology sorry, theology and literature at uh, Baylor University. He taught for over 25 years at the uh, other big Baptist University in the United States, Wake Forest, for a long time, and then gave up uh, success in men's basketball anyway to migrate, not women's, to migrate to, uh, to Baylor about 10 years ago now. And this year we're fortunate to have him as the uh, Marianne Remick uh, uh, visitor, senior visitor here in the uh, Center for Ethics and Culture. Yeah, come on in. There are some seats for older people around over there. Okay. The um, Ralph's career has been devoted to studying the interface between Christian uh, theology and Western literature. And he's especially uh, noted for his uh, interest in and work on a, a, a series of uh, American and British authors, especially American. Flannery O'Connor has been a lifelong interest of his, and uh, he's written on uh, John Updike, Peter DeVries, Walker Percy, uh, Tolkien. And this year, he's devoting his, uh, his time at the center to a project on G.K. Chesterton. And that's the topic of today's uh, paper, is the dialogue with atheism, uh, Chesterton's The Ball and the Cross. He's uh, interested in, um, I, I sort of gravitate toward the more philosophical works of Chesterton and Ralph to the uh, literary works, and so this is very, uh, very interesting for me. I have not said much here about uh, Ralph's uh, career, not just as a university professor, but as a, a preacher, a, an award-winning teacher, um, and a lot of other, just, he's an all-around great guy. So I uh, want to present to you uh, Ralph Wood. Thank you very much. Well, I was reflecting lately, uh, since we, my wife Suzanne and I have been here for four months, on the centrality of Notre Dame to my whole life. And it really hit me with a sudden force when I realized that it was Notre Dame Press that in 1988 uh, published my first book called The Comedy of Redemption, uh, a book which is kept in print for 20 years. And it was by giving me that start as a young professor trying to get his work underway that Notre Dame really began to uh, make things possible for me. And then thanks to the extraordinary hospitality of David Solomon and the Center for Ethics and Culture, if I've counted right, this is my sixth lecture at Notre Dame. And so this has become a, almost a second home. As you know, Baylor and Notre Dame feel themselves, we certainly feel ourselves very much in kinship with, with you folks here. And then to have this year to spend the entire academic year uh, on the campus taking advantage of the wonderful work of the center, not only David Solomon, but of course Elizabeth Kirk and Dan McInerney, uh, his associates, and then having uh, Alistair McIntyre two doors down uh, from my office. Imagine the challenge that that presents. Um, and to have uh, a whole cadre of Chestertonians here at Notre Dame. Professor Fredoso teaches an entire course in Chesterton. Uh, David Fagerberg in theology has a very fine book on Chesterton. Uh, there's a Chesterton club that meets regularly, uh, consisting of all kind of faculty and staff members who know Chesterton's work well. Uh, he himself gave two lectures here, uh, two series of lectures in 1930 
1931, uh, that became the basis for one of his best and most important books, The Victorian Age in Literature. Uh, but he got off one of his best lines here at Notre Dame. He was 6'4 and weighed 235 pounds. And he wore this gigantic cape that made him look even larger. And so by the time he came here in 1930 and 31, he was no longer able to stand to lecture. And so he had to sit. And this was just in the days when microphones had been invented and were coming into play. And so Chesterton sat down. I'm not sure it was in the Basilica where the lectures were delivered. And his first words were, ladies and gentlemen, I'm not as large as I seem. This machine has amplified me. <laughs> <laughs> well, he also said the modern um, world view is that of a slightly sleepy businessman right after lunch. So I'm faced with a huge challenge of not slightly sleepy business people, but of, um, I hope, not too sleepy academics. I've actually altered the title of my paper a bit uh, to make it somewhat more modest. It's called The Gift Greater Than Tolerance, um, G.K. Chesterton's The Ball and the Cross. I'm going to try as far as I can to take up the challenge laid down to me years ago uh, by a former student who's here today from Wake Forest, Cindy Caldwell, who says, stop reading all those papers, start talking. So I'm going to try as far as possible to talk this paper. I'll have to do some reading, of course. So I begin with some of Chesterton's outrageous claims. Modern toleration is really a tyranny. It is a tyranny because it is a silence. To say that I must not deny my opponent's faith is to say that I must not discuss it. In a very similar kind of barbed aphorism, he said, tolerance is the virtue of a man without convictions. And he explained the pagan persecution of the early Christian church as oddly enough justified. He said, Christianity was intolerable because it was intolerant. Well, these very angular convictions of Chesterton have got him often dismissed, as you can, can see, as a kind of antediluvian reactionary seeking an ark whereon he might survive the flood of modernity, uh, a kind of comic curmudgeon seeking to reinstate an idealized uh, version of the Middle Ages. That's simply untrue, and much of my the burden of this speech is to show how that is untrue. Uh, for example, he was an unrepentant enthusiast for the French Revolution. You can't be anti-modern and be in favor of the French Revolution, of course, with modifications. Uh, he believed that the French Revolution had done in its own crude political way what the Christian church was trying to do all along and had done very incompletely and, of course, um, terribly inadequately. Namely, to give a new kind of social and political um, sufficiency to the common man, uh, as the common man had not had that freedom prior to the revolution. In his great book on Dickens, the, the most democratic of all novelists, he said, what the French Revolution helped us recover is the Christian conviction that all men are equal as pennies are equal because they bear the stamp of the king. Of course, he's talking about a time when England had a king, but you get his point. We're all equal because we're created in the image of God. Well, Chesterton knew that with democracy comes um, a real challenge to Christian faith because, of course, the state can no longer impose um, any kind of conformity to a single way of life, uh, much less to a religious way of life, because it begins to recognize that there are legitimate differences uh, in points of view and behavior and the like. The shorthand word for the regime which modernity creates, of course, is the word liberalism. It's very noteworthy that Chesterton described himself as a liberal from his youth until his death. Now, I had a capital L because it, in his case, meant a political, poli uh, particular political party, but he also never forsook the word even in the lowercase l. There are, of course, many kinds of liberalism, not one kind, uh, but I think the uh, political theorist Judith Sklar has come closest to describing what the generic term liberalism means, and I quote her. Every adult 
should be able to make as many effective decisions without fear or favor about as many aspects of her or his life as is compatible with the like freedom of every other adult. Well, G.K. Chesterton made a massive effective decision about his own life uh, by becoming a Roman Catholic and therefore uh, exercising the freedom that a pluralistic culture invites and welcomes. And he crossed the Tiber, I think, very clearly because he sought a faith that would enable him to make his way in this new democratic and pluralistic world, a faith that would have barb, would have edge, would have pith, would have heft, and therefore would let him withstand uh, all of the terrors of modernity. He, of course, had first become a devout Anglican, largely through the influence of his wife, and then, of course, he converted and joined the, and became a communicant of the Church of Rome in the year 1922. I think Chesterton's very conversion reveals that he saw liberalism as having a canker at its core and that the worm eating at the heart of liberalism was called tolerance. For while liberalism would offer protections against common evils, it would have an increasingly difficult time defining common goods. And so Chesterton was among the very first to recognize that his own inherited liberalism which he freely embraced and espoused, would lead to the unprecedented rise of secularism, and that is, of course, the displacement of religion from the center of human life. The movement that began with the aim of setting people free, alas, would end by imprisoning them, by vacating the public square of all those virtues which alone might prevent a return to what Hobbes called the brutish and slavish state of nature called the war of all against all. So what I plan to do in the first part of the paper is give a brief survey of the history of tolerance, followed by what I regard as the best Christian alternative to tolerance, and then a brief exposition of the ball on the cross. So those are the two parts of the paper. Tolerance, of course, has been uh, the center of modern mentality almost from the start. Spinoza, Milton, Lessing, Bale, Roger Williams, William Penn, all, of course, devoted themselves to the topic of tolerance. But, of course, it's John Locke's letter on toleration that stands as the center of that debate, uh, both then when it was written and, of course, still now um, in our own time. Some of you know um, Locke had been exiled to the Dutch Republic, uh, where he found a secular state that would permit religious differences. And he decided and desired to bring that same kind of freedom back to his own native England and to therefore prevent the wars of religion from devouring England as they had devoured uh, much of Europe. He did so uh, by attempting to view the whole world from an eagle iry. That is to say, he sought to take a stance outside all the traditions, looking down upon them from what he regarded as a neutral point of view, um, by way of all the ethical virtues that people of goodwill could discern, and, and therefore to judge those, uh, those religions and forms of Christianity from that, de he was a deist, from that deistic perspective. Uh, the key to Locke's whole uh, position uh, on tolerance is found in the, among the opening sentences of the letter on toleration, which read, the sentences read as follows. There's an acerbity here I'm sure you'll catch in, in uh, Locke's lines. He jumbles heaven and earth together, the things most remote and opposite, who mixes these two societies. In other words, he's against the attempt to jumble the two worlds together. And of course, you can see what the move he's about to make. Our civil interest, that is the interest of earth, or what he called life, liberty, you can get the you can hear the, the, the American Republic emerging here as well. Life, liberty, health, and property. Those are the four goods, he says, the civil state is ordered to preserve. They must be so preserved by violence, if necessary, by force. Religion, by, the con by contrast, deals with life beyond life, 
It deals with our eternal state beyond the world. And about that, the state has nothing to say, says John Locke. It has no power to compel any kind of religious conformity and therefore must simply stay out of all kind of disputes over matters of the forms of worship, uh, matters of doctrine, um, interdenominational uh, brouhaha's and the like. The state has nothing to say about those because those all deal with the life of the soul, whereas the state deals with the life of the body. You can see then that issued very quickly in a kind of radical privatizing, subjectivizing, and individualizing of religion, uh, not only in England, but in, in America, which would follow in Locke's train. Because, as he said very famously, the care of every man's soul belongs unto himself and is to be left unto himself. Well, from that kind of individualism, he then concluded that only those churches that were tolerant of the view I've just described could be themselves tolerated. That meant that the Anglican Church would remain the established state church of England but that the various kinds of dissenters, Baptists, Presbyterians, Congregationalists, and others, would be tolerated so long as they were tolerant. Two groups were left out of the tolerance claim. Atheists. Anyone know the other? Catholics. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Catholics, that's right. Locke said about Catholics, they deliver themselves up to the protection and service of another prince. And therefore, they are deleterious to the life of the state and must therefore not be tolerated. Well, the problem with Locke's uh, denial of, um, of Catholics, their own religious freedom in England, is very interesting. On the one hand, I think Locke is right in saying the state cannot compel belief. That's surely true. <coughs> Uh, the church, of course, has standards that must be met in both doctrine and practice. As we were saying last night, the church in certain sense does enforce its own matters of belief and practice, but the church, it's, uh, that the state itself cannot so impose um, beliefs and religious practices upon people. That would be, of course, coercion. God himself doesn't coerce. The state surely must not. The rub comes rather in that phrase, another prince. Now, of course, Locke refers to the Pope. But what Locke doesn't understand, of course, is that the Pope is the earthly representative of capital A, another, capital P, Prince. That other Prince, of course, that all Christians put themselves under the primary protection <laughs> and service thereof. So if Locke had been really true to what the Pope stands for, he would have, of course, made all kinds of Christianity um, not tolerated in the state. Well, from such sentiments, as you know, uh, a lot of pernicious things arose. The person who's best accounted for the pernicious bit, uh, uh, um, effects of the Enlightenment is William Cavanaugh, in my view. Uh, do you know his work? He's up at the University of St. Thomas in St. Paul has written very powerfully, trying to offer an alternative account of the so-called wars of religion. He said, we've had that whole notion imposed on us falsely, that the wars of religion were not only wars uh, that, were, that had to be stopped, not so much out of political necessity, says William Cavanaugh, but rather out of political convenience. He says, these wars mark the birth pangs of the sovereign nation state, precisely as John Locke envisioned that state. Now, Locke couldn't imagine how large the state was going to become. He couldn't imagine how much the state was going to become linked to, uh, to the whole huge matter of the, of the uh, market economy. He couldn't predict that. But he did see. Locke saw what real threat the church constituted. And therefore, he said, political power began to be centralized in the Enlightenment so as, and I'm quoting Kavanaugh, to provide a monopoly on violence within a defined territory. 
Calvin no notes that all the, the language of the Enlightenment began to secularize Christian terms. You got rid of doctrinal terms and began to talk about kind of vague abstractions, rights, and uh, utility, uh, and so forth. Then he says, this is, I think, the stunning statement. Christianity produces divisions within the state body precisely because it pretends to be a body which transcends state boundaries. In other words, the church is a universal community that cannot be contained with any particular nation state and therefore offers a real threat to the nation state. And therefore, the way you can find that threat, of course, is to make, as Locke did, religion individual, private, and subjective. You've got it contained in that way. Well, that led, of course, to the kind of individualism which uh, we know has been at the, at the canker at the core of the American project uh, from the beginning. Because what happens is that freedom becomes completely reconstrued under the Lockean vision of what it constitutes. Freedom is um, defined negatively, of course, as doing no harm to others, or positively as constructing one's own life without let or hindrance. The freedom notion that is lost under the Lockean vision, of course, is this one. Namely, the Christian notion of freedom as obedience to a telos radically transcending ourselves and thus wondrously delivering us from bondage to our mere self-interest. So, um, at its worst, liberty comes to mean life lived according to one's own individual construal of reality. Some of you know Justice Kennedy in the um, Roe v. the um, uh, Planned Parenthood versus Casey case that was the case, of course, upholding Roe v. Wade, uh, inserted the following clause. It's rumored to be from Kennedy. Uh, I hope it's not from Kennedy. You know, Kennedy's a Catholic. I hope he would not say these things. But someone in that majority opinion said, at the very heart of liberty is the right to define one's own concept of existence, of meaning, of the universe, of the mystery of life. That's now become known as the mystery clause, some of you may know. Well, when Kennedy said that, if he did, he's simply following up on the kind of leads that Locke gave him. It's been pernicious not only for religious life, but even for secular life. Consider, for example, the words of Wendy Brown, herself a political theorist and feminist, who says this about what has happened to us. That which is most vital to individuals, qua individuals, i.e. personal belief or conscience, is not only that which is now divorced from public life, but that which is divorced from shared truth. We've been hearing that, of course, repeated at this conference. Once you get rid of the notion of truth with an uppercase T, then you've now lost everything. Tolerance of diverse beliefs in a community becomes possible to the extent that those beliefs are phrased as having no public importance, as being constitutive of a private individual whose private beliefs and commitments have minimal meaning, minimal bearing on the structure and pursuits of political, social, or economic life. And above all, is having no reference to settled, common, epistemological authority. That's the awful epistemological consequence of modernity as Locke sets it up. It also, of course, has a horrible moral consequence as well. But what happens with the late modern notion of tolerance is that those who advocate it are usually those who've already gained power, such that they can afford to, quote, tolerate their opponents. And as so long as the tolerated agree to play by their rules, tolerance usually reveals that someone has already won and someone has already lost our much vaunted American ideal of state neutrality in religious matters often means that the governmental principles and powers tolerate, sorry, I meant that the government, governmental principles and powers uh, have adopted a particular notion of the good that's the basis for its, their toleration 
uh, built upon Enlightenment notions of utility uh, and rights. What I would like to propose today is that the best Christian alternative to that false notion that I think has bedeviled not only the church but also the state is the notion of hospitality. It seems to be a better way of trying to deal with radically opposing construals of reality, not by a polite tolerance that obscures the governmental power arrangements underwriting it, but something very different. And it's that which G.K. Chesterton, I believe, sets forth in The Ball and the Cross. Just a brief note on hospitality. It, uh, and I'm indebted here to my former student, Elizabeth Newton. Elizabeth um, um, taught at St. Mary's. Newman, Newman. Newman sorry, not, not Newton, Newman. Elizabeth Newman taught at St. Mary's. She has a fine new book on tolerance. I urge you to have a look at it. She says, hospitality does not mean a smiling kind of niceness, does not mean prim and proper etiquette, um, it doesn't even mean a gracious capacity for party giving, though we all like that kind of, uh, of, um, of hospitality. She says hospitality derives from the Latin, the Greek word hostis, a very interesting word that means at once stranger and enemy. So you see where, where we're going. Hospitality thus becomes a practice, a discipline, a responsibility regarding those who are alien and perhaps even antagonistic towards us. It requires, among other things, the willingness to welcome the gift that others represent. Not the gift that we desire necessarily or expect from them, for often their gifts will come as fundamentally hostile to our own basic convictions. The word tolerance, by contrast, has an equally interesting Latin heritage. It originally meant to endure pain or hardship. And therefore, of course, it came to being putting up with the opinions and practices of others. And so there is a very decisive difference then between tolerance and hospitality. Tolerance says, in effect, we will put up with you. Hospitality says, we will put you up because it also related, of course, to the word hospital, and you can see the other cognate terms. And, of course, hospitality becomes, I believe, a very large earthly analogy to the gospel itself. In Romans 5.10, we learn that while we were once enemies and strangers to God, he has taken us into his household. And so we must be willing to offer hospitality to those, to those who are alien and even enemies to us. Now, the granting of hospitality doesn't mean that we draw no distinctions among competing truth claims. That's what tolerance, it seems to me, often winds up doing. Uh, Chesterton has a marvelous aphorism that will help us here. He says, morality is very much like art. Sorry, get it wrong. Yeah, that's right. Morality is very much like art. It consists in drawing a line somewhere. <laughs> exactly right. Well, hospitality draws a line, but it does not raise a bar that cannot be crossed. <coughs> On the contrary, hospitality is willing to hazard two radical risks regarding enemies. On the one hand, it must take them so seriously that not only can enemies recognize themselves in our representation of their own most basic concerns and convictions, but also that we might be susceptible of conversion to their position. On the other hand, we as Christians are also called to demonstrate in both act and argument our own commitments and concerns so as to create the possibility of their conversion as well. So conversion, as I see it, must lie at the heart, at least the possibility of it, at the heart of hospitality. But in either case, we will not merely have tolerated each other we will have exhibited the hospitality that eagerly engages each other. So then, to the ball and the cross. How many of you read the ball and the cross just out of curiosity? Good, good. I urge you, as I tell my students, get thee to the bookstore. Um, <laughs> it's in print. 
um, and it's a, it's a wonderful, wonderful book. Well, it involves two vehement foes, enemies, not just strangers. They are really hostile to each other. The one a Christian, the other an atheist. And, of course, they're trying to have, as we're going to see, a real engagement uh, of their opposing hostile points of view. Um, because Chesterton has the conviction that any belief worth embracing must be worth dying for and not only living for. And so these two enemies have sworn not only to have a fierce argument about their most basic and fundamental convictions, but to cap it off with a sword duel unto death to see who really wins. <laughs> So this is a philosophical dust-up that will take, of course, many, many surprising turns. That's indicated from the outset. When the novel's essential humor is set forth in the opening scene, where a professor aptly named Dr. Lucifer <laughs> has captured a Bulgarian monk named Father Michael from his mountain retreat, and taking him aloft in his flying machine. Remember, flying machines were still just being envisioned and not invented in 1911 when this book was um, uh, first published. So as to demonstrate to this dumb monk that the cosmos is empty. It's kind of like the Russian astronauts. You know, they look for God everywhere. He couldn't find him, so it's empty. So he decides he'll take this monk up in the plane, take him over all the face of the earth, show him there's nothing there in the heavens, uh, they're empty, the Welkin rings uh, completely void, no God, and therefore win the case. But he suddenly sees this object looming before him, thinking it to be another planet. It turns out to be the ball on top of St. Paul's Cathedral <laughs> in London, uh, which, as you know, is, uh, it has a, a, a cross affixed it uh, on the top. And, of course, he's so discombobulated by seeing what he thinks was a planet and, of course, he undergoes a virtual exorcism in confronting that cross that he's about to crash into the ball of St. Paul's Cathedral when the monk takes over the controls and quickly enables them, if you believe it, to land on the edge uh, of, Saint, of the Dome of St. Paul's. Uh, that's letting you know from the start that this is a book that's not any kind of realism. <laughs> it's a book of a very different kind, to say the least. In a very fine recent book on Chesterton and Tolkien that I commend to you highly by Allison, Allison Milbank, it's called Chesterton and Tolkien as Theologians. And her original title, and my review of it, by the way, is in the current um, online version of First Things. The original title was um, The Catholic Fantastic of Chesterton and Tolkien. It's a wonderful title, but it was taken away from her, unfortunately, by the uh, her publishers at TNT Clark. But um, what she says is that from the, from the outset, Chesterton is trying to stagger our imagination by making things arrestingly strange. Everyone looks up at, at the ball of St. Paul's with a cross on top and takes it for granted. When there's a, a flying ship that's about to crash into it, it cannot be taken for granted at all. Well, you can see also the kind of semi-allegorical quality. The monk, the, 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 the monk Michael uh, is very much like um, uh, his un eponymous uh, uh, namesake, the unfallen archangel, while the cleft-bearded professor, Dr. Lucifer, is clearly the mutinous archangel in modern form. And so they begin a philosophical argument. They're on the dome of St. Paul's. They start fighting it out intellectually. And making us thus ask the question, why would Chesterton resort to such a strange genre as farce to write about such a serious matter as Christian faith over against its atheist opposition? <coughs> That's the heart of my book project this year. I can give it to you only about three sentences now. And that is, Chesterton deliberately resorts to farce. It's virtually impossible situations, it's extravagant occurrences, it's, it's frantic pace, and above all, it's wildly improbable conclusions because he believes that only a form like for, a farce 
can capture the strangeness of the gospel. That's a radical thesis that I hope I can establish in a year's time. Uh, he believes that only those art forms which have destabilizing power of farce and mime and even melodrama can capture the gospel's own outrageousness, its fantastic eccentricity, its scandalously joyful claim that God has entered this human fray in Jesus Christ and his church. And of course, farce enables the, uh, the creation of outsized characters. Uh, he loves the grotesque, Chesterton does, making him very akin to my great love, Flannery O'Connor, for whom that's a, her favorite term. And so what we get at the start is a wonderful grotesque uh, contest going on, but as it's embodied between an ardent English unbeliever named James Turnbull and a very devout Scots Catholic named McKeon. One's a lowlander. Others are Highlander. You get the perfect kind of counterbalance. And they've come into a very fierce conflict because McKeon has walked up to the newspaper uh, edit editorial office of a paper called The Atheist uh, that's being run by Turnbull and takes a rock and smashes uh, the, the window of the editorial office of The Atheist because Turnbull has published an article, which takes us to the heart of the matter, suggesting that the figure atop the dome not only um, at Notre Dame, but in other places, namely that of the Virgin Mary, is a merely mythical figure, typical of all primitive religions, i.e. a pretty maiden who had consorted with a god and given birth to a hero. Well, for McKeon, by contrast, she is the one about whom Christians make staggeringly paradoxical claims, namely that this teenage Jewish virgin is in fact the Theotokos, the very mother of God, the one whose womb bore the second person of the Trinity. And she is therefore the exemplary figure of Christian faith for having professed belief in Jesus even before he was conceived, be it done unto me according to thy word. That faithful response to, to the annunciation made by the Archangel Gabriel is, of course, the profession that every Christian is called to make. Be it done unto me according to thy word. And therefore, Turnbull's blaspheming of the Blessed Lady, denying her uniqueness by reducing her to a mythic invention of the human imagination, is, of course, for McKeon, the Catholic, at Act Tantamount to denying Christ's own unique incarnation. Therefore, these are fighting words indeed. However, there is a problem. Everyone in England is determined to prevent McKeon and Turnbull from having their fight. And of course, the alleged reason is that these men have pledged to kill each, one of them to kill the other uh, by way of a sword duel unto death. And, of course, the notion is that our tolerant modern world is so enlightened that we've advanced far beyond the benighted medieval practice of the sword duel. It's interesting that Chesterton pegged from the start the two forces that would seek most vehemently to prevent this metaphysical and physical just, i.e., the law and the press. He sees from the start what are going to be the two most oppressive things in modern life. The journalists on the one hand uh, and the lawyers and police on the other hand. They are the predominant shapers of modern life uh, because they've been persuaded, as we learn, by all the forward men of the age that dueling must be halted. But, of course, that's a ruse. It's not the duel they want to halt. It's the metaphysical debate of ideas that they want to stop. Their real aim is to prevent a serious argument. So Chesterton begins to make the central contention that though the Enlightenment allegedly prized the debate of ideas and their consequences, it's premised upon a refusal to debate them in our time. That the heirs of the 17th century 
argumentation tradition have replaced philosophical engagement with a practicality and an efficiency that have been rendered deadly by the absence of any aim or purpose beyond themselves. Broad-mindedness, says Chesterton, has come to mean empty-mindedness. Some of you know he says in one place, the purpose of an open mouth is the same, of an open mind is the same as that of an open mouth, to shut it on something solid. And of course, this, the attempt to prevent this debate is to prevent anybody from having shutting, to shut their mouths on something solid. Well, here's how it goes. Turnbull is convinced, as an atheist, that he can be a moral man without any kind of theological conviction. So he's in favor of honor, liberty, and humanity. Those are his three great ideals. But he's convinced that these high principles, these moral ideals, um, do not need any kind of metaphysical underpinning or reference, that they can be maintained without faith in God or Christ or the church. In short, the globe does not need the rood that's riding it. They are divorced. They're just with Locke. They're being mixed, in his view, foolishly. So, um, McKeon begins to address the very problem. Whether humanistic virtues and values can be sustained without transcendent reference. McKeon says they can't. If they're cut off from transcendent reality, having no relation to any all-surpassing idea of the good, they will either collapse or turn pernicious. Now, what's interesting about his defense uh, against those kinds of uh, moral ideals of Turnbull is that he makes a, a metaphysical argument about the essential goodness of all things created. In other words, human existence for McKeon can have ultimate worth, and therefore there can be keen moral distinctions about how to honor that ultimate worth only if the world itself is considered as a great, grand gift of God having absolute value. This is, his, this is a very fine statement by McKeon. To me, this whole strange world is homely. Now remember in England, homely does not mean plain. Homely means cheerful, warm, homelike. To me, this whole world is homely because in the heart of it, there is a home. To me, this cruel world is kindly because higher than the heavens, there is something more than humanity. And if a man must not fight for this, may he fight for anything. I would fight for my friend, but if I lost my friend, I should still be there. I would fight for my country, but if I lost my country, I should still exist. But if what that devil, and the devil, of course, is Turnbull, his opponent, opponent thus far, if what that devil dreams were true, I should not be. I should be like a, I should burst like a bubble and be gone. I could not live in that imbecile universe, one without metaphysical reference, one without ultimate order. And shall I not fight for my own existence? Of course, a rhetorical question. Well, what that devil Turnbull is dreaming of, as, as uh, McKeon describes it, is nothing other than what I'm going to call today scientific physicalism, as it's become the regnant creed of modern Western life. I've learned from um, Alistair McIntyre to not call this materialism. He's been very helpful here. Uh, and Chesterton agrees. He says Christians are materialists. We have a real investment in the goodness of matter. So in a very uh, non-negotiable sense, we do want to call ourselves materialists, but we don't want to call ourselves physicalists uh, in the sense I'm about to describe. Physicalism is the notion that the universe is an unsponsored and undirected process, a self-sufficient realm of matter in motion, a domain having no ultimate aim or purpose beyond its own inherent patterns, so that nature exists only to be mastered and manipulated by human means or human ends alone. In short, everything that exists 
operates solely according to its physical nature and relationships. So physicalism, I contend, is the air we all breathe philosophically. It's all the more penetrating and suffocating for being largely unconscious. Already in 1911, when Ball and Cross was first published, Chesterton had discerned that physicalism would come to underwrite not only our thinking, but also our entire culture of comfort and consumption and convenience. Its central, though unstated, premise is that the purpose of life is to stay alive as long as possible, the better to enjoy ourselves, often by means of hedonistic pleasures and sensate entertainments, or else to improve ourselves, at least our physical existence, by various methods of scientific hygiene. I remember having Stanley Harawas uh, come down to Wake Forest where I began my career, and, and we passed by a huge hospital there in, in Winston-Salem, and we were both noting, as Chesterton, Walker, Percy, and many others have, the medieval cities were all centered around a cathedral, of course. Our cities are centered around either hospital complexes, of course, or business complexes, telling us the gods we really worship. And Stanley, with this typically dramatic way, we said, behold the house that death has built, he said. He said, if you ask the average American, what is the purpose of life? He says, if we're caught in a moment of unguarded response, we'll say the purpose of life is not to die. And, of course, the Christian proposition is precisely the opposite. The purpose of life is to die, rightly, well, faithfully. I was at a conference of a bunch of Mennonites in um, Chicago a couple of weekends ago, and they were telling us about how these universities are adopting what are called outcome performance as a means of determining uh, true excellence. You have to set forth these outcomes, and then you measure whether the outcomes have been met or not. He said uh, a Christian university should have as its chief outcome the production of martyrs. <laughs> <coughs> I think he's right. Well, the argument thus far seems to be between a theist and an atheist, a believer who credits God and an unbeliever who doesn't. And yet, what I want to maintain is that McKeon is no mere theist. If I might quote Ralph McInerney, he is a clandestine and perhaps even a peeping Thomist. <laughs> you know, Mac McInerney has a very fine book called Peeping Thomist, Confessions of. He argues, McKeon does, that he is form, no less than matter. And what is more radical still, he argues that the church is the place where his own bodily matter is given its proper form. And I'm quoting him, what I think is the most stunning passage in the book. The church is not a thing like the Athenaeum Club. If the Athenaeum Club lost all its members, the Athenaeum Club would cease to exist. But when we belong to the church, we belong to something which is outside all of us, which is outside everything you, Turnbull, the physicalist, talk about. It's outside even the cardinals and the pope. They belong to it, but it does not belong to them. If we all fell dead suddenly, the church would somehow still exist in God. Confound it all, don't you see that I'm more sure of the church's existence than I am of my own existence? This is the real scandalous sticking point between, between McKeon, the Catholic Christian, and his atheist interlocutor, Turnbull, the physicalist. The absolute worth of human life is not to be found in matter alone, but rather in matter as it is susceptible of form. As Chesterton will later discover in his wonderful little study of St. Thomas, and I'm quoting him, the word formal in Thomas' language means actual, possessing the real decisive quality that makes a thing itself. Roughly speaking, when Thomas describes a thing as made out of form and matter, he very rightly recognizes that matter is the more mysterious and indefinite and featureless element. 
that what stamps anything with its own identity is form. Matter, so to speak, is not so much the solid as the liquid or gaseous thing in the cosmos. And in this conviction, he concludes, most modern scientists are beginning to agree with St. Thomas. Of course, he's living just after Einstein's great discovery. McKeon puts his basic trust, it follows, in the all-decisive act of God to establish the final form of the world in the Jews and Jesus and the church. His, his essential identity issues from his baptismal life, his sacramental life in the body of Christ. Odd though it seems to say his humanity is something acquired no less than received. It flowers and flourishes only through its proper formation in the habits and practices of the Christian life. And far from being a cozy coterie of the like-minded, the church has taught McKeon to value strangers, even to honor enemies, such as Turnbull, not with a condescending tolerance, but with an engaging hospitality if only in the oxymoronic hospitality of a sword fight. Hence the riotous irony of two would-be pugilists seeking, or rather having to flee by ever more outrageous escapes from the forces of the law and the press. So you get this series of wonderful uh, attempts to get away from those who are trying to stop them from having this argument and this sword fight. And they, it comes to be in this wonderful uh, moment of, of, of clarity. I must kill you right now, said the fanatic McKeon, because, well, because, said Turnbull, patiently, because I've begun to like you, uh, <laughs> answers McKeon. Why, your affection expresses itself in an abrupt form, <laughs> Turnbull began. You know what I mean, McKeon continues. You mean the same thing yourself. We must fight right now or else. Or else, repeated Turnbull, staring at him with an almost blinding gravity. Or else we, might, we may not want to fight at all, answered Heaven. <laughs> because I've begun to like you. <laughs> well, you can see wonderfully these two enemies are becoming real friends. However, they discover two enemies to whom they cannot extend hospitality. And here's where the limits of dialogue enter. With uncanny foresight, Chesterton saw that the two philosophical enemies of both Christianity and physicalism already made evident in the 19th century are the followers of Leo Tolstoy on the one hand and Friedrich Nietzsche on the other. These men they will not extend hospitality to because they lie beyond the pale. They will not enter dialogue and for the reasons that you're about to see. The Tolstoyan they meet, he's not given the name, uh, believes that all creatures uh, have equal importance uh, because they must be loved indiscriminately. They, therefore, everything, uh, the physical suffering becomes the ultimate evil. Everything must be kept alive at all costs so that dogs and cats and children are all on a level plane, none to be exalted over the other. To differentiate, to differentiate animals from humans is, in the Tolstoyan's view, to use the ugly argot of our time, to be guilty of speciesism. And so you can see um, McKeon is getting here a parody of his own Christianity. If you're not careful, Christianity can turn as soft-hearted as the Tolstoyans. And here's what McKeon says to the Tolstoyan. Give up fighting. He learns this actually from an angel who appears to him. Give up fighting and you'll become like that, the Tolstoyan. Give up vows and dogmas and fix things, and you may grow like that, the Tolstoyan. You may grow fond of that mire of crawling, cowardly morals, and you may come to think a blow bad because it hurts and not because it humiliates. And you may come to think murder wrong 
because it is violent and not because it is unjust. Over against the soft-hearted Tolstoyan that they refuse to offer hospitality to, even by way of argument and sword fight, is the Nietzschean. His name, this cannot be providential, but his name is Wimpy. <laughs> he is enamored of the will to power. He is a hater of all humanitarianism. He worships naked strength and what he calls force, the God who loves blood. He's convinced that the universe is ruled by might alone, and therefore Wimpy hails what he calls the naked and awful arbitration, which is the only thing that balances the stars. In other words, the cosmos is a great clashing um, universe of opposing forces, and because the cosmos consists of these awful, violent clashes, that's what human life must consist of as well. Vi victus, he says, woe to the vanquished. The conquered have no routes, rights. Down, down with the defeated. Victory is the only ultimate fact. Well, Turnbull, the physicalist, begins to have some real reservations about his own physicalism when he sees what's been done with it by this Nietzschean. He begins to undergo his own kind of philosophical conversion at this point because he sees there's no power within his own physicalism to resist the Nietzschean because the Nietzschean begins to use some very dangerous language. For example, about nature loving always the strongest. Chesterton, you can see, is moving right in our direction. Absent a vision of nature, as ordered to the good of both humanity and divinity, however strange and paradoxical that order may be, the Nietzschean will always maneuver physicalism into its own ma maleficent purposes. We're, in, we're getting near the end, so hang with me. Before the end comes, both McKeon and Turnbull have a horrible nightmare vision of what their own philosophies, of what their own world would be like if their philosophy could triumph. So Turnbull has a nightmare, horrific vision of Christianity turned into a theocracy, where Christianity is enforced upon people. And of course, it turns out to be an absolutely cruel place. Turnbull, in contrast, has a vision of what his world would be like if physicalism were to triumph. And his awful doppelganger proudly declares, listen to how prophetic these words, life is sacred, but lives are not sacred. Capital L, life is sacred, but not small case, lives. We are improving life, capital L, by removing lives, lowercase l. Well, what they've both seen is the horror of their own position if it were not restrained. Proving thus Chesterton's great conviction, and I'm quoting him, it is not bigotry to be certain we are right, but it is bigotry to be unable to imagine how we might possibly have gone wrong. That's what they both envision, how they've gone wrong. And in so envisioning it, they become, of course, the very best of friends. And yet their friendship cannot be confined to themselves alone. And so, in their last and final escape, they climb over this wall that looks like perfect freedom and discover they've landed in, a, in the garden of a gigantic insane asylum. <laughs> Run by the state because the House of Commons has passed a bill declaring that every person who cannot be certified sane must be put in prison in order to be rehabilitated. Again, a vision of the future in 1911. The chief executive officer, the CEO of that great hospital, of course, is Dr. Lucifer, of whom we've heard nothing since the beginning. There is no worry about anybody escaping this gigantic state insane asylum because the moment you get outside it and are discovered not to be wearing the right letter, i.e., a huge letter S, you will be remanded to the prison. The S signifying, of course, sane. This is 1911. 
Chesterton foresees the democratic cultures of the West capable already of not using the letter S, but of course the white badge with the blue star of David on it, signifying Jew. The one being, of course, the S, a spiritual kind of exclusion, the star of David, of course, being an exclusion unto death. I'm quoting, in the first village you entered, the, the village constable would notice you were not wearing on the left lapel of your coat the small pewter S, which is now necessary for anyone who walks about beyond asylum bounds or aside, outside asylum hours. Two years after The Ball and Cross was published in 1913, Winston Churchill introduced the Mental Deficiency Act. It followed upon the Lunacy Act of 1890, which had given physicians virtual carte blanche in confining the allegedly mad to asylums. Churchill had proposed, among other things, that those who lack sufficient intelligence would not be allowed to marry and thus not to propagate themselves. But the real animus was against what were called the unproductive poor. Isn't that an interesting phrase? Chesterton named this for what it was, a demonic form of social Darwinism. He said it's a, a, a kind of combination of a savage capitalism with a dreadful kind of Darwinism that tramples the destitute and the pauperized, forcing them into self-abandoned drink and sex as their only earthly delights. He wrote a great book called, therefore, Eugenics and Other Evils. Uh, one of the most powerful witnesses against the attempt that was made, being made, where almost everyone of, um, of repute advocated it. Oliver Wendell Holmes, a justice in the American Supreme Court, a strong advocate of it. Listen, Margaret Sanger, H.G. Wells, Beatrice and Sidney Webb, George Bernard Shaw, Virginia Woolf, Clarence Darrow, Harold Lasky, Calvin Coolidge. America must be kept American, Coolidge wrote in 1921. Biological laws show that Nordics deteriorate when mixed with other races. The president of the United States. In our own time, Nobel laureate in physics, Steven Weinberg, has offered a morally self-canceling judgment that is but the latest version of physicalism. The, and I'm quoting him, the more the universe seems comprehensible, the more it seems pointless. He therefore urges his fellow physicalists to take up arms against religion, routing all who would discern moral, moral and spiritual order inherent in the way things are. I'm quoting him, anything we scientists can do to weaken the hold of religion should be done. Notice, anything and may, in the end, be our greatest contribution to civilization. Well, the ball and the cross pushes us to ask Weinberg's question. Whether a sometimes comprehensible but ultimately pointless universe can house and nourish anything akin to civilized life rather than the culture of death that turned out to be far worse than Chesterton could have foreseen. As you know, the 20th century proved to be the deadliest epoch in human history. More people killed by violent means than in all previous centuries combined, roughly 180 million, most of them, of course, killed by their own governments. We can't expect a slender novel like Ball and Cross to answer that all-determining question, but it gives us two crucial hints. The first comes by way of an outright miracle performed by Father Michael. He's almost let us forget this monk because he's not been around since he was captured on the very first day. He's been placed in a, in a room that, where there's no light whatsoever. He's dwelling in total darkness and has been there for months. And yet he's not gone insane. He's kept his sanity because they had created there as a thing to drive the patient nuts a spike that comes out from the wall. And it's very... Inutility, its uselessness, was supposed to be a way of the state reminding you, look, buddy, 
we're doing things that you can't possibly fathom. But of course, the monk began to see that the spike standing out from the wall is very much like the cross upon which Christ was hung. And so, far from losing his faith, his soul so fully formed his body that when in the great holocaust, the asylum is set on fire, he leads the whole company out through the fire, walking right straight through it himself, unsinged. Of course, this is Moses delivering his people uh, from bondage. And I think Chesterton's suggestion, we may take, it may take a, a miracle of Father Michael's proportion to save our world from its hell-bent condition. He walks through the white-hot hell singing like a bird, says Chesterton's narrator. But a miracle has to also to be embraced for it to have effect. And it is embraced by Turnbull. Reluctant though he is, he's been con convinced of his, his, his physicalism. But he finally, this scientist, this denier of ultimate order, falls to his knees. But it's not just by his having it's been stunned by this miracle. It's been by the hospitality shown him, I believe, by Evan McKeon. Some of you know there are Mennonites right now in Iraq who are not seeking dialogue. They are simply offering hospitality to Palestinians and to Jews, saying, we won't. Of course, not many Jews in Iraq, but they're doing that in Israel. We want to live with you. We want to put you up. We want to befriend you. We want to show you by our example, who our Lord is. Seems to me that's what real hospitality is about. And that's how this novel ends. And so I conclude with this wonderful phrase from the novel. All England has gone into captivity in order to take us captive, McKeon confesses. All England has turned into a lunatic asylum to prove us lunatics. When I saw that, I saw everything. I saw the church and the world. The church in its earthly action has really touched morbid things, tortures, bleeding visions, and blasts of extermination. The church has had her madnesses. And listen, I am one of them. I am the massacre of St. Bartholomew. I am the Inquisition of Spain. I do not say that we have never gone mad, we Christians, but I say that we are fit to act as keepers of our enemies. Chesterton makes evident that we Christians will not convince our atheist adversaries by means of superior argument alone. Rather will their sympathy, if not their conversion, be won by this cruciform confession that extends hospitality even to enemies. To act as fit keepers to our enemies is not to seek victory over them, it is not, in fact, to seek victory at all. In perhaps the novel's single most lapidary statement, McKeon declares that the cross cannot be defeated because it is defeat, capital D. It is the defeat that constitutes the only lasting victory, the foolishness that is the one permanent sanity. McKeon and Turnbull were indeed mad in wanting to kill each other. They are saved not by tolerance, however, but by the hospitality that creates friendship. A few days ago, McKeon confesses, you and I were the maddest people in England. Now, by God, I believe we are the sanest. That's the only real question, whether the church is really madder than the world. The ball of the cross offers a powerful fictional demonstration that the mad earth requires the even madder cross the instrument of suffering and shame that the incarnate God has transformed into the welcoming shape of hospitality by mounting it himself, inviting all to bow before this ultimate act of divine humility. Turnbull, McKeon declares near the end, we cannot trust the ball to be always a ball. We cannot trust reason to be reasonable. In the end, the terrestrial globe will go quite lopsided, and only the cross will stand upright. I believe that false notions of tolerance often make the world wobble on its axis, producing alienation rather than reconciliation. The rude rightly crowns the orb, not like a knife thrust into its heart, not in order to subjugate and tyrannize it, but rather as a handle atop this bobbling buoy called the earth, 
so that all of us, its floundering inhabitants, might grab hold and thus be saved. I thank you. entertain questions. I'm sorry. I, uh, my wife says I've never given a speech that was too short. <laughs> well, we do. We have a couple of minutes anyway. Please. Friendship of Chesterton had, you know, famously with George Bernard Shaw, was occurring, of course, at this time. They would have public debates, and they had the very highest regard for each other. I don't know the particulars of that. In, do you, Fred, in relation to this book? No, I don't. I don't know the particulars. Um, but, you know, Chesterton was not uncritical of, of Shaw. He said George Bernard Shaw would have us all eat grass uh, if given his, his way. He also said... George Bernard Shaw is like the Mona Lisa. All that there is of him is admirable. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Father John. I'm the Dominican, so maybe the Benedictine. Right. <laughs> <laughs> My name is not Michael, but I would lay claim to being a dumb monk sometime. Uh, the question of hospitality in the rule of St. Benedict, chapter 53 on the reception of guests, begins by saying, let all guests be received as Christ. Uh, later in the rule, in chapter 66, on the porter of the monastery, so this is the guy who's guarding the door, he says this to be an old man whose age prevents him from roaming around, and when anyone shows up, he's to greet them with thanks be to God or ask for a blessing from the person. So here's an image of hospitality, I think, in the rule that suggests that hospitality must also be open to being hurt yeah. and to being and to a sacrifice. And I was yeah. wondering if you would... I have really no more to add to that. I think that's that's absolutely right. Um, I have to, though it embarrasses him terribly, to confess that I had not been at Baylor a week in 1998 when a fellow who's here today, Scott Moore, said, you need to learn that hospitality is a lot better category than tolerance for Christians. And he's absolutely right. He'd read this, he taught the rule of St. Benedict. But I think you're right, we've got to be hooked. And therefore, he, he's going to refute my thesis. Let him defend himself. Very good question. Very good question. Um, the question, why not hospitality to Nietzsche and Tolstoy? Well, first of all, to their adherents, as they somewhat badly misread both of them. He had the very greatest admiration for Tolstoy. Chesterton did. He had nothing but contempt for Nietzsche. You know, Alistair McIntyre, in his new collection of essays uh, from Cambridge Press, um, has a really good essay on toleration where he says that one of the most important acts of any community is to establish those who lie outside its bounds of, um, he doesn't call it hospitality, but of welcome. And he said there are certain, there are certain kinds that do, that do lie outside the bounds. I think for Chesterton, once you become convinced of a Tolstoyan um, kind of soft-hearted um, equalizing of all things to this single level plane, there's little hope for conversion because it's hard to see how that leads to horror. It's easier to see how physicalism leads to horror. In Nietzsche's case, you've got horror already advocated from the start. In fact, I did not read a devastating passage of which uh, Nietzsche celebrates the 20th century as the century that's coming of wars. And we will have the finest wars of all the 20th century. Can I extend Please. that question a little and ask how then we should apply this to our current cultural dialogue or lack thereof with the Islamic world and their unwillingness to come to the table? 
Uh, in our uh, little city of Waco, our professor of Islamic studies has become very close friends of the Imam. Uh, he goes to their services. He's become friends of a number of members of the, the local mosque. And they do things together. They go out for meals. I mean, it's very important, not just the talk, as I was trying to suggest here. That's why the Mennonites are doing such magnificent work in Israel and Palestine and Iraq. Uh, so that would be the best, the best way to try to make friends. And by doing that, by, as I say, inviting them to the common meal, uh, offering them whatever help we might be able to offer, if they will receive it. Yes, Victor. What is this concept? How would this, would you describe for us what we're trying to do? The question was, how would this notion of hospitality link to our common mission as people teaching in universities uh, that seek to be Christian? I've been helped here a great deal by Will Willeman, some of you know, longtime chaplain at Duke. He says that we wrongly estimate young people uh, and believing that they don't want parietal rules. He said they don't want them in a certain sense, but in the deepest sense, what they really want is an adult friend. And the faculty is meant to be the adult friend of students. And I think that's exactly, that would be the first place to begin. Not to, in other words, have engagements with our students outside and beyond the classroom, either in common worship, around a common table, doing common projects. Sounds, I'm repeating myself, it seems to me to maybe be one way. Yeah. I, I thank you, Professor Wood, for, uh, for talking about this book. I, I, I've not only read it, I teach it too. So, I'm, mm. And I think it's, there's so much in there, and, uh, and I'm, I'm glad to see it highlighted. I wonder if I can offer one Please. suggestion about the Tolstoy and, and Nietzschean. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not sure, you might not agree with this, but it seems to me, instead of not extending hospitality to them, in the way the story works, they don't accept the hospitality of the Nietzschean and the Tolstoy well, that's, because they're looking for a place to have their duel. That's right. And that's they right. both are initially offered a place. That's like, right. This is a this is a place where your your strange dialogue can happen, as right. it were. That's but very I, but good. But either the Nietzschean and the Tolstoyan, they seem to be friends at first. Right. They're kind of concerned, but they're false friends. That's right. That's very good. They when they see the terms of the of the debate that. Turnbull and McKeon want to have, they, they withdraw their hospitality. Yeah. That's very good. I'll correct that in my revised paper. Yeah. I'm just curious about the reciprocal virtues of the guest. Um, I'm a father of two daughters. There's some people I'm not going to let into my house. <laughs> <laughs> and part of my job is to guard my house. Uh, right, so I'm, I'm engaging in discriminating judgments. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going to let in and I'm not going to let in. I said that you know, art draws a line. Yeah, um, but it doesn't lift an absolute bar. There has to be, you know, some some line of discrimination about who is in, as I said, and who is out. And I think politics is about that. Sorry. Politics is about that. It's about, about that precisely. Making those discriminating judgments. Yeah, I would argue that the church is the place where um, we exclude virtually no one, uh, and that's the place where, unlike your house, where you don't let certain people in. You welcome all, and therefore offer hospitality to those who. Um, well, we heard uh, the art, the Archbishop talk about the presence of the Israeli guards, you know, who came in and who, who, who offered them hospitality of a very, seems to me, Christian kind. They said, "We have a protector here. We don't need your guards. We'll keep you. Keep the guards out." Good. Yes. of the atheist Turnbull was uh, kind of uh, took away from the message a little bit. Yeah, that's the, that's the, the did you hear him? The, the question is, does the conversion of Turnbull um, make the, the book seem kind of fixed and, and formulaic at the end? I don't think so. First of all, he doesn't make a conversion of any full orbed kind. He simply gets on his knees but notice he has his hand on the shoulder of the Christian lady whom he hopes to marry. 
And in Chesterton's world, that marriage will, of course, be a part of his conversion. But no, I don't think so, because as you say, they, they have been, they've been becoming deeper and deeper and deeper friends, and the deepest of all friendship is the sharing of the deepest of all commitments. And I think they're going to, that friendship will have its consummation in, in shared faith. Yeah, go ahead. And a follow-up then, would, um, what kind of message would you, uh, would you say to try and stem people from, from McLean's the, the Scotchman? Mm -hmm. McKeon, I call McKeon, it. McKeon, his, his, his demonic dream of coercion, Christian coercion, the people fighting, saying this is for your own good, for, for truth, you know, what, what would, what kind of message would you say to stem away? Sure, sure. Well, the, the, you know, when, when, when Chesterton calls Christianity an intolerant religion, he does not mean that we put people to the sword or burn them at the stake. He means that we, we really do offer them engagement and therefore um, fighting in the good sense of the word. Uh, you've all heard the truism that there's nothing so much like fighting as lovemaking. You know, it's hard to distinguish sometimes. So I think, yeah, you want, you want engagement. You, you, to hold, hold back our fundamental convictions as we engage others is a deceit. It's a false tolerance. In fact, a friend of mine, uh, Thomas Hopko, I'm sure you know him, a very great Orthodox theologian, said the only place at which Christians ought to enter real dialogue with Muslims and Jews and members of other, other faiths is when we've all gone to the absolute depths of our own faith. We don't have the right to talk to each other about matters that are adiaphoral, matters that are really tertiary, but matters that are most fundamental, the nature of God, the nature of humanity, the nature of salvation. Now, we may not get to those right off the bat, but they can't be avoided because that's where, that's where real engagement occurs. I think we're going to have to uh, call the proceedings to a halt here.